Oh, the, I'm not sure, whoa. <laughs> Turn it down a little, Dave. I'm not sure about the timing, because the time disappeared on me, but I'm going to assume it's the correct time. <laughs> so we'd like to welcome everyone this morning. Special welcome to those who have come for this service that thought they were coming for the first service. <laughs> but everyone, we're glad to see you. We'd like also to welcome those who have joined us online, and uh, it's a delight to have everyone with us this morning. Now, at this particular uh, service, then uh, John Barbin and his team are going to be leading us in worship, so we're looking forward to that. And then Nicholas Sarlo is going to be speaking to us about uh, Elijah. He's introducing our series that we're starting. It's just a short series, but we're starting it this week, and uh, we've named it Elijah, God's Mountain Man. Every time I read that, I think of Bigfoot, but I don't think it's Bigfoot that we're going to be talking about. God's Mountain Man, Elijah, one of the most important prophets from the Old Testament scriptures. And then also remember that uh, tonight... <clears throat> Uh, at 4.30, those who are doing the church history course, it will be running again tonight at 4.30. And then on uh, Sunday evenings, now I'll just get you to go to the next slide. I made up a little slide there. I tried to add a few flowers. You know, it's springtime. Cheer things up a bit. That's actually a pic picture of Heather from the hills of Scotland. So it's not a spring flower, it's an August flower. But it's beautiful. Anyway, for, for uh, Sunday evenings, we got quite a lineup if you look at it there. Um, tonight, we're having Devo and Dessert, and our brother Jim Snell is going to be doing the devotion. And so we would invite you back for that tonight. And uh, that will be at 6.30. Then next week, we thought we would do a social event. So uh, we're going to have a potluck supper. And so because it is a supper, then rather than being at 6.30, we will have it at 6 o'clock. And so just come and uh, bring something with you to eat and maybe a little extra for uh, some others and just enjoy a time of fellowship together. And then the next Sunday evening, we're actually having a movie night and uh, Nicholas uh, had, has a nice uh, movie, a good movie that he rented for us, and so we'll be watching that, and then the next week you have it off. So that's our lineup for Sunday evenings for the month of, of March. Now, we have some events coming up too, and there's one that just came in this morning, and so I'll read it here. But it says, uh, there is a college and careers, spring formal, on Saturday, March the 16th, at 6 p.m. at Bethel. There's going to be a dinner, followed by some games, and uh, you're being asked to please respond by this Wednesday, Wednesday, March the 13th. So, for all of those who are in that age group, college and careers, uh, a spring formal, March the 16th, so that'd be next Saturday, and please let people, uh, I guess it'd be one of the two Abbeys, Abbey Marshall or Abbey Peak, if you're coming by March the 13th. And then I have the others uh, on my PowerPoint. I love making up PowerPoints. Oh, this is our Missionary of the Month. So those of you who don't know Brad and Catherine uh, Dixon, they've been serving the Lord for nearly 40 years. Uh, in France, and uh, so they're our missionary of the month, and so they're the ones that we are especially praying for this month. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, here's one of the events, a newcomer's lunch. Now, we seem to have a lot of these because God has blessed us at Bethel here with a lot of new people coming, and so to try and get to know you and for you to get to know us and learn a bit about Bethel, then we'll have a newcomer's lunch, and that's going to be in two weeks' time on March the 24th. And then if you go to the next slide, 
uh, we have a baptism coming up. And uh, this week we had someone else contact us desiring to be baptized, which we're, we're very thankful for. You know, this is something that's associated with salvation. It's not part of being saved, but once a person has become a Christian, this is what happened in the early church, is that they trusted Christ as Savior, and then they were baptized. That was the second step. And so we would encourage anyone who has not been baptized that knows Christ as Savior, if you want to get in touch with one of us elders or one of the pastors, then um, we would be delighted to speak to you about that. Now, the next slide is, uh, this here is again for the ladies, Connect Four's uh, Spring Tea, which I think is not this Monday night, but next Monday night. So you see all the details there. And so all the ladies are invited to come to that and to bring a friend. Okay, so remember that. Now, the next slide. Uh, this is one as well we want to talk a couple of minutes about, but this is the Caring for the Heart. Uh, ministry. There's uh, Bob and Gwen. They're the couple that have, are going to be coming to speak to us about relationships. Um, again, they've been doing this for, I don't know, between 35 and 40 years, so they're not novices at all. Uh, you can see their um, mission statement there, and uh, they do a wonderful work. And uh, there's been more, there's been a number of couples. We know that there's lots of problems in relationships. I mean, that's a fact of life. And there's been a number of couples from Bethel that have actually gone down and visited Bob and Gwen. And Bob, or God blessed that visit. And uh, as a result, uh, things are going well today. And so uh, we would really encourage you to come. It's not just for married couples, but for it's, they're going to cover all kinds of relationship things. Uh, you can see the list there. That's their schedule. Uh, it's happening in April and 26 to 28, but mark it on your calendar, and please come Friday night. There will be a snack and a couple of sessions. Saturday, lunch will be provided, and you can see the sessions there, and then they will be finishing up on Sunday morning at this particular service. And uh, all of those sessions, I'm sure you will find interesting and very helpful as far as living in 2024 is concerned. Okay, so that's coming up. And then we get a couple other things, just very quickly. Next slide. Uh, ladies' Spring Banquet. Now, I know that this used to be called the Coffee Hour, and Joyce told me last week it was called something else. And then by this week, I had to guess. So this is the old coffee hour uh, banquet. So we'll call it the Ladies' Spring Banquet and notice the nice cherry blossoms there. Again, to help cheer you up today. The spring is here, flowers are coming, and God is good to us all the time. And so that's another event to keep in mind. Now, I believe that's all the events. So uh, we're going to move on then to um, prayer requests. And we have a number of prayer requests. Uh, one that Ruth mentioned to us in the first service, and that is we need to pray for Diane Kells. And we should also pray for Jim, her husband, but especially for Diane, who has been in the hospital for some time, and yet there has been some progress this week, which we're thankful for, but she still needs the Lord's blessing. We need to pray as well for Joe and Louise Bello, uh, Joe had uh, a rough time this week, and things really didn't look all that good at one point, but uh, he has, God has brought him around, and we're thankful for that, but we need to continue to pray for Joe and Louise. And then I also mentioned in the first service that Don McPhee, who is Daniel Sedolia's uh, sister, uh, he, she is going down to Toronto, and... Um, She's uh, going to be flying down there the, this afternoon with Janina, and so we need to pray for uh, God's blessing as she's having an operation tomorrow, fairly serious, I believe it's tomorrow, serious operation uh, with relation to the heart. And then we have a lot to be thankful for, for Ruth's brother, John. Uh, we need to continue to pray for him, and uh, I believe he's home now, 
and we need to pray for complete healing for him. Might also mention that Ann Kokinen's mom passed away this week, and so we need to pray for Ann and her family that the Lord will comfort and sustain them. And then continue to pray for uh, Keith Nicole. I'm not sure if Keith is able to be here this morning. Uh, I don't see him. Uh, so remember to pray for Keith. He's got a very serious operation coming up with uh, his stomach because of his cancer. And we want to pray for God's blessing on him and his family and for his, his uh, recovery and, and return to uh, health. Also remember Luke Catava. Don't see Luke here this morning as well. Luke has heart problems. We need to pray for him. And there's so many, but God is able to meet all these needs. He is a great physician. And so all of those who are sick, I hope and haven't missed anyone that I should have mentioned, but there are many that are sick, but God is able to meet the need of each one. And those who uh, sorrow, he's the God of all comfort. And he's the God of all grace. And so we're just going to commit ourselves to him. And then John and his team will lead us in worship. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have this morning of gathering together and uh, being able to listen to your word. We thank you for you, the prophet Elijah. We thank you for the way that you used him so many years ago in the nation of Israel. And Father, we just pray that as we would start this series, that your blessing would be upon it. And that we would not only learn history that's associated with the nation of Israel, but we would learn important lessons that would uh, help us day by day to live and to honor and glorify you. And Father, for all those that we have mentioned who are sick, Father, we thank you that you are able to meet their need and you are able to bless each one that we have mentioned. And Father, there are others as well. And we pray for your blessing upon them. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. And Father, for all those who are away from us for uh, celebrating the March break and having a little holiday, we pray for safety and we commit them to you. Bless in the Sunday school. Bless in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. You all have your singing voices on? If we could all stand up and uh, worship God together this morning. Turn back to praise when 
the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away My heart will choose to say Oh, blessed be your name You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Oh, blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious
your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts Than thousands elsewhere oh, Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts Than thousands elsewhere Than thousands elsewhere I come thou found of every blessing to thy heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song and some by flaming tongues above the mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer To thy, thy help I come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to Arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, here to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to praise our great a debtor. My heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. For thou, O Lord, art I above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all God. Thou, O Lord, art I above all the earth. Thou art exalted.
Amen. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what is happening in heaven? That, the exaltation of God, making much of his son. Thank you for joining with us in that. Thank you, John and team, for leading us. Well, good morning. Welcome to Bethel this morning. We're so glad to have you. And I know as you open your Bibles this morning, they might fall open to Romans naturally. The corners in my Bible are very bent and bruised uh, in the book of Romans, but we're moving on. We get to work in another passage of our Bible. So you can turn to the book of 1 Kings this morning. That's in the first half of your Bible, uh, you know, in the first 10 books. So uh, in my Bible, it's 273. If that helps you, uh, it won't help you. 1 Kings. We're going to break in another book here together. It's my privilege to introduce uh, this new series focusing on the character of Elijah, God's mountain man. So my task is to prepare us to understand Elijah within his biblical context. Because here's the deal. God didn't give us the book of Elijah, all right? We don't have a book of Elijah. This story is found in the book of 1 Kings. And 1 and 2 Kings in our Bible, it's actually just the book of Kings. Uh, it's one scroll. It's one piece of literature. And God gave us books as the, his, his method of communication. So the verses, the chapters, we added those to help us navigate it. But God gave us books. God gave us letters. So my goal is to cover the book of First Kings before we get to Elijah. So chapter 1, most of the way through 16, to ground us at what God is trying to do in that book so that we can understand Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel in their proper context next week. And what the, book, what the books of Kings instill in us is a sense of anticipation, uh, of disappointment, and of expectation. In 1 Kings, we're going to reach the zenith of the kingdom of Israel. In the past, in the present, in the future, it has never gotten better than the United Kingdom under Solomon. But by the end of the book of Kings, the kingdom is divided and fallen, and both Israel and Judah, now two separate nations, are exiled in Assyria and Babylon. So what happens in this, this great high point and the deepest low point, the books of the kings and the story of Elijah, they leave us wanting. They leave us needing a better king, a better priest, a better prophet. Of course, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. So we're going to start how we always start. We're going to read God's word. Let's read 1 Kings 1.1, and we'll read through to 16.28. How does that sound? Oh, you guys listened. I thought I might get that past you without you hearing it. No, I wouldn't do that to you. That's a pastoral practical joke. That's what we call those. We are going to read sections of 1 Kings. We're not going to get to read the whole thing, but I would encourage you, read it on your own this week over the next little while. Ground yourself in this story so that as you hear Elijah, you're not going, oh, this is a separate event. It's part of God's redemptive history. 1 Kings 1.1 says this, Now, King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So let's, let's, let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for these records, the joys in them, the victories in them, the trials in them, the challenges in them. I ask you would convict us of our sin and you'd present your son Christ before us as something better, something perfect than anything we can create without you. 
The gift of grace is beyond our comprehension. And, and speak through me and to us as we consider these things. And I ask as we consider Elijah that we would long to hear that voice again of, of the way of the Lord is prepared and you would return and come back to bring us home, Lord. Bless it. our time today, our ears, our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So that first verse of 1 Kings, this gives us the first piece of information we need to know about the books of Kings, all right? Um, the first piece of information is the rise and then subsequent fall of the monarchy, the kingship in Israel. So the first thing I want to look at is that the story of the king, kings leaves us expecting a better king, a better king. So the king of Israel was meant to be a leader, a father in really in some ways to the nation. His role was to steep himself in the word of God and the worship of God and therefore adjudicate and model that to the nation. And the book of Kings reveals the success, the temporary success, but the ultimate failure of really all earthly rulers, leaving us eager for the perfect lordship of Jesus Christ. But we start here in 1 Kings 1.1, and let's talk about David. How did we get to David? So the first rumblings of, of kingship are really found in, in the Garden of Eden. If you hear me preach enough, you, you won't. It's not a surprise. I'll go back to Genesis 1, 2, or 3 at the beginning of a sermon. So God creates this world. He places the man in the garden, and he gives the man dominion and authority and rule over creation. Adam is the first king of the world set by God to adjudicate his creation. And Eve is given to him as his queen. But the king and the queen rebel. And death and sin enter God's kingdom. But, Genesis 3.15, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. You shall bruise his head. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So there, in the midst of the greatest failure of mankind, we're given the image of a conqueror, a hero, a king who's going to crush the serpent's head. We're looking for one person who is going to come and be victorious like a king should. And the Old Testament is this anticipation of this kingly character. But after this promise, the only kings we see for a while are really kings of the sons of the serpent. So the pagan nations, the evil people of Noah's day, the Canaanite kings, and one king in particular who actually puts a snake crown on his head, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Generally, kings in the first part of the Old Testament are the villains of the story. They're the bad guys. But then at the end of Genesis, Jacob, Israel, blesses his sons, and he makes this statement about his son Judah as a prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So there's a king, one who will wield a scepter that will come from Judah's line. And then after the enslavement, the salvation, the wanderings of Israel in the book of Exodus, they get to the edge of the promised land, and God gives this word to Moses in Deuteronomy 17. And it's worth reading, so if you have a Bible, please turn to Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 14. Deuteronomy 17, 14, and we'll read through to 20. It won't be on the screen, so please listen, read along. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book of a, the copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to, may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, 
that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom and his children in Israel. So that passage needs to be ringing in our minds as we read the book of Kings. That is the passage that's going to define how we understand 1 Kings, 2 Kings. And actually, the books of Joshua all the way through to the end of 2 Kings can be read in, in terms of Deuteronomy. It is the story people are telling. It's, it's written to the people as they're exiled in Babylon, trying to explain how did this happen? How did we get here? The book of Deuteronomy, contrasted with the history, tells the people why it happened. But back to the king, Israel. So Israel takes the land, conquers it, and there's, there's judges for a time, tribal leaders, regional heroes that are used by God to adjudicate and rescue Israel. And Samuel, books of 1 and 2 Samuel, is the final judge of Israel. And the people ask Samuel, give us a king like the nations around us in 1 Samuel 8.5. Now, the desire for a king is not wrong. We just read that God said you could do that. But their motivation, so that we can be like the nations around us, was wrong. And God was displeased, but he gave them the king they wanted. And God gave them Saul. They asked for Saul, the first king. And Saul is basically a, a picture of earthly rulers gone wrong in the worst way. The first time we're introduced to Saul, he's a son who can't keep track of his father's donkeys. And by the end, he's a king who can't keep his country safe. So God fulfills his promises from Deuteronomy, and he appoints a king after his own heart, his own choosing, David. And David is anointed king, and then he waits on God to crown him king. Saul dies in battle, and David becomes king over Israel in the books of First and Second Samuel. And David vanquishes Israel's enemies, establishes Jerusalem as the capital of the nation, and we see this, 2 Samuel 7, 1. The king, David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given rest from all his surrounding enemies. And this is the high point in Israel's history. And at this high point, God comes down and he speaks to David, and this is the promise he makes to David. 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God makes a covenant with David, a promise, just like he did with Abraham, to sustain his house and always place a son of David on the throne of Israel. But not only do we need to remind ourselves of, of the victories and glories of David as we come to 1 Kings, but we also need to be reminded of his, his failures. In 2 Samuel 11, David should be at war, but he's at home lounging on his couch, and he looks out the window and sees a woman bathing on the roof. Her name is Bathsheba. He sends for her. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He can't convince her husband to neglect his duties and, and sleep with her, so he orchestrates his murder to cover up his sin. But God sees it all and judges David for his action. He says, the same sword you wielded against Uriah will now be wielded against your own house. And it cost David four children in consequence to his sin. And after this incident with Bathsheba, David really declines as a leader. He seems to lose his courage and moral backbone to confront things in his kingdom. So officials in his courts like Joab will run wild and his sons Abnon, Am, Amnon and Absalom, they run wild and are both end up dead. And the seeds of disunity within the nation have been sown and that carries into 1 Kings. So now we get back to 1 Kings 1.1. 1, 1. David is old and it's time for his son, Solomon, to become king. But they got to act fast because there's a couple other sons trying to vie for the position. So some fancy political footwork, and David establishes Solomon as the heir and the new king of Israel. And Solomon is the son of Bathsheba. David then charges his son, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways that you may prosper. He reminds Solomon of the promise God made to him. And then David dies. The nation mourns the loss of their great king. And that's the end of Act 1 of First Kings. And then starting in chapter 2, verse 13, we have the rise of Solomon. 
I'm going to turn back to 1 Kings so I can have it in front of me. So Solomon deals with some leftover issues, some people his father wasn't able to deal with, uh, and then establishes his kingdom. And then there's the famous passage where God shows up and says, what can I give you? And Solomon says, give me wisdom to lead these people well. And God grants him that uh, request as long as well as riches and long life and victory because of his humble request. And Solomon rises in wealth and power and peace. And he begins his father's dream, the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. And it's a big deal. We're going to talk about that next. But Solomon's role as king takes the nation to the point where he can worship with this statement in 1 Kings 8.55. And this is huge. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all that he promised, not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. Here Solomon says the promise made to Moses, to Abraham, is fulfilled, partially. He has given them land, he has given them children, he has made them a blessing to the nations. A remarkable statement. God has kept his promises. But then, we all, in the Bible, all good things must come to an end. And then reality and sin breaks through. And Solomon's rise becomes a free fall. And over the next few chapters, the author of this this record in 1 Kings clearly compares God's commands in Deuteronomy to what we're seeing in Solomon's life. So if you look at 1 Kings 10 and 11 is where you can turn. Look at this. I made a little chart to compare the two verses here. So in Deuteronomy 17, it says, He, the king, must not acquire many horses. 1 Kings 10.26, Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. 17.16, do not trade with Egypt for horses. 1 Kings 10.28, Solomon imports horses from Egypt. 17.17, he shall not acquire for himself many wives, lest they turn his heart away. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. 1717, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. 1 Kings 10.23, Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth at riches. 1720, that his heart should not turn aside from the Lord. 1 Kings 11.4, his heart turned away to other gods. The author of 1 Kings is holding Deuteronomy in this hand, looking at Solomon in this hand and going, yep, 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 oh no. And God shows up again in 1 Kings chapter 11, 11 to 13. God says to Solomon, Because this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And I'll keep reading. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give you one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Very quickly, enemies rise up within Israel, which lead the nation to become divided. So rather than the 12 tribes of Israel being 11, Levites didn't have a province, but the 12 tribes being united under one king and calling themselves Israel, 10 of the tribes in the north joined Jeroboam, a man who God appointed to be their king, with their capital eventually becoming Samaria, the good Samaritan, and the way they they hated the Samaritans. This is where it starts. And two tribes, Judah and Benjamin in the south, keep the line of David as their king and establish Jerusalem as their capital. And starting at the end of chapter 11, this, this familiar rhythm of the book of Kings starts. And each king from here on will end their life with a statement like this. 1 Kings 11, 41 to 43. I have it on the screen. Now, the rest of the Acts of Solomon, all that he did, and all his wisdom, are they not written in the books of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. And the rest of the book is the account of the various kings of Israel and Judah overlapping, interacting. 
And our story, Elijah, will take place 50 years from now, 57 years from now, in the northern kingdom of Israel um, after the nation has split. And we see that not only are each king is sent out the same way in kings, but they're introduced in similar ways. So look at 1 Kings 15. And we're going to see an example of the common cadence we'll hear at the beginning of each king's reign. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam began to reign over Judah. That's in the south. He reigned, and, and Jeroboam is in the north. So they always tell you what year this king, this king showed up and where that was. Abijam began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom, and he walked in all the sins that his father did before him, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. So two important information. Every time you read Kings, there's two pieces you need to notice. You should notice what kingdom their ruling is, Judah or Israel, and then you should notice whether or not they did right or evil in the sight of God. That's what the author wants us to see in this rhythm. And this image here, you can't see it very well at your size, but it represents, you can see the colors. The kings of Judah are on my left. The kings of uh, Israel are on, you you can see it uh, there. You see in the kings of Israel, all black. There's not a single king whose heart is committed to the Lord their God for the rest of their history. In the southern kingdom of Judah, we've got some white, we've got some gray, but really only four kings that the Bible would describe as not turning to the left or the right and being wholly true to the Lord their God. The kings of Israel and Judah end up pointing more to idolatry and wickedness than righteousness and purity. So the kingship in the Old Testament is kind of a bleak picture. What was supposed to be a blessing and bring prosperity instead created war and death and idolatry. And ultimately it brings down God's judgment on both Israel and Judah. So what are we we supposed to do with that? Well, first, I think we can say sin matters, brothers and sisters. It has real consequences in our lives, in the lives of others, and ultimately in the life of a nation. So we need to see our sins for what it is. See your sin for what it is. Confess it, repent of it, and kill it by God's grace. If the story of David and the kings teaches us anything, it's that sin in our lives should never be tolerated. It is not a lamb we have tamed. It is a lion seeking to devour us. Secondly, we remember that our our ultimate hope and allegiance is not in any earthly ruler. Even the ones appointed by God will fail and let us down. All of our service to earthly rulers is with an eye to our ultimate allegiance to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. He is the only one whose judgments will be true, right, and equal. And no other ruler we have or even the ruler we might hope for can ever supersede that. And I think finally, we can take this idea of dominion, authority, what God has given us, what God has given you, and take it seriously. So fathers, husbands, mothers, wives, your homes, your children are your kingdom to serve God and rule well and righteously. For all of us, your work, your ministry, your home, your Christian life is your dominion given to you by God and you are accountable for it. So work hard by God's grace, prayerfully striving for righteousness, stewarding your resources well, knowing that following God's wisdom doesn't just have earthly benefits, which it does, because God creates a world of order, but because there are eternal rewards and seeds you are planting for God's kingdom. I hope, and I hope your hope is as well, with all my failures, all of my sins, all of my weaknesses, I would love a sentence like this to be written about me someday. We're looking at Asa, David's great-great-grandson. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. So kings, when we read it, it leaves us longing for a better king. There are two more offices highlighted in the books of the kings that I want to look for as we look towards Elijah. We need to talk about the priesthood because these stories in 1 and 2 Kings also make us long for a better priest. The story of Elijah in Kings is full of true worship and false worship. 
But even the glories of Solomon's temple pale in comparison to God's presence with us in Jesus Christ as the Word made flesh by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. So the priesthood, the people who stood between God and humanity are a critical part of this story. And can you guess where I'm going to go to find our first priest? Genesis. Yeah, the garden. Adam, Genesis 1 and 2. Through Adam, God's presence and rule is communicated to the creation. It is mediated through Adam as his intercessor. But when Adam and sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, the man and the woman could no longer enjoy God's presence. They needed a mediator. What did they do when they realized when they ate the apple? They looked down, saw they were naked, made clothes. They put a barrier between God and themselves. And from now on to this day, our worship and relationship with God has to be mediated. It means someone has to, we need a middleman. The question becomes, how can a holy God dwell with an unholy people? So God answers this and he appoints a place of blood, of darkness and ceremony where his presence can be sought and sins atoned for. This is the tabernacle. The tent that is given to Israel in the wilderness where the Ark of the Covenant was placed and where a certain group of people, the Levitical priests, could be set apart to serve God and atone for the people's sins by blood. And in David and Solomon's time, we get the greatest change to the priesthood in its 1,300-year history, and that is the construction of the temple, a solid, unmovable place for God to be found. It was David's dream to build a house with all the earthly glory possible to honor Yahweh. But God says to David, he's like, did I ask for a house? I gave you a tent. It's been fine for me. I don't know why you want to build me a house, but fine. That's kind of what God says. If you want to do this, I want the nations to see me as glorious. Build me a house. But David, you got too much blood on your hands. You're a man of war. You cannot build it. Your son will build this temple. So David spends the final years of his kingship building all the materials and the business relationships and the plans to build the temple of God. This is an image of what it may look like, a building of stone and precious, precious stones and cedar and solid gold where the presence of God can be sought. And after seven years of construction, the ark is brought into the temple. And Solomon prays a prayer of dedication to God. And I want to read this, 1 Kings 8, 27 to 30. First Kings 8, 27 to 30. Solomon prays, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God. Listen to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. That you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place. And listen to the plea of your servant and your people Israel when they pray towards this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And five times in this prayer of dedication, Solomon begs God to hear the prayers in and to this place and to respond with forgiveness. The deepest need of the human heart is forgiveness of sins. The books of Kings and Elijah's ministry is going to confront sin in some of its most horrible, horrific forms. And what we learn is no other God can intercede for you. No amount of money or status can elevate you before a holy creator. Nothing else can cleanse you from what you've done and what you are other than blood. The wages of sin is death, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the temple was this golden jewel in the middle of the most populous city in the country to point people to God's majesty, but it was also a place stained with blood that stank of burning flesh day after day, sheep after sheep, goat after goat after bull after pigeon, and on and on it went without end, rivers of blood flowing out of this place. What hope do we have in the blood of sheep and goats offered by men who share the same nature as we do and are sinners before God? None. Would any of you trust anybody in this room to atone for your sins with sacrifice? 
No, and you have no more hope of dealing with your sin than any of those people did in the tabernacle with their pigeons or lambs or goats. Not without the gift of God in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is a great high priest who mediates before us in the presence of God, interceding for us. He is also the temple where we can meet with God and see him face to face in a new and perfect way. But he is also the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins today. The offerings of the temple, they proved to be inadequate to shape the hearts and minds of the people in the book of Kings. But the blood of Jesus has cleanses us from all unrighteousness and transforms our dead souls into living children of God. And even at the most glorious moment of Israel's history, if I had a time machine, this is where I would go. The cloud of God's glory descends on the temple, driving the people back as God himself dwells in this house of gold. It's a spectacle of love and grace and power, but it would not last. And sin and judgment would come. We need something better, brothers and sisters. Jesus, the better priest, the better temple, the better lamb. Because the state of worship in the book of Kings declines generation by generation. But God does not leave his people with kings and priests alone. He sends the messengers prophets to speak for him and call the nation to repentance. But even with the miracles of of Elijah and the visions of Jeremiah and Isaiah, Ezekiel, we're left needing a better word. Not a word that confronts us, but a word that transforms us. Not just bringing conviction, but bringing life from the dead. Because the book of Kings leaves us longing for Jesus, a better prophet, a better prophet. Elijah is a prophet So from the time of Moses, the people were taught to really expect someone to speak for God. Moses was the first great prophet speaking to God as with a friend. But at the end of his life, this is what he foretold uh, in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, this is Moses talking, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So you see here, not only does our worship of God need mediation by priests, but our hearing of God's voice needs a mediator. We can't deal with God's voice and truth and righteousness directly. So priests bore the risk of entering God's presence for the people into his holiness with fear of being struck down for their own unholiness. But the the prophet bore the burden of bringing God's words to the ears of the people. So in David and Solomon's time, and early in the book of Kings, we're introduced to Nathan. Nathan is the one who confronts David of his sin with Bathsheba. And when Nathan shows up to David, this is what he says. He says, thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel. (laughs) The authority by which the prophet spoke was the very word and authority of God. And David And Solomon, the kings, and us as well would do well to heed their words in the same way. And the words of the prophets fell into two categories. What they said, two categories. The first is the foretelling. This is what we're most familiar with. They would say something about what is going to happen. Usually like, cut this out or this is going to happen. Telling what would happen in the future. But most of what prophets said was not that. They weren't looking at the future, they were looking at the present. And they were foretelling meaning they declared God's truth to a generation who needed to hear it. Think about it. You and, you and I have these books, the Bibles, in our laps. We can look on our phones at any time and have God's word and discern his will. But in Elijah's day, in the day of the kings, they didn't have the word of God. The kings had a book. The priests had a book. And the people were dependent on hearing the kings read it and the priests read it and their own work to memorize it and internalize it in order to bring God's word to their minds. 
So prophets were sent to remind and tell the people of what God had already said, usually in the form of, cut it out! God is angry at your sin. Repent. Turn back to him. And through God's word, the Bible, and through godly preaching that honors God's word, God still speaks with that prophetic voice today. I would encourage you, don't get weary of hearing from God. It doesn't always feel good, but it is good. Don't harden your heart to the hard words of God, because if we want to avoid all the hard words and all the hard situations in our lives, what we're going to miss is not just the hard things, we're going to miss God himself. The story of Elijah is the story of a hard man sent and equipped for a hard time. He's going to stand in between the gap between a wicked king and queen and ignorant, wicked people and stand and speak hard words and work incredible wonders. He's going to speak to kings and kings and queens and priests with boldness and courage. But Apostle James reminds us Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And we're also going to see Elijah wrung out, exhausted, feeling hopeless, begging God for death in the face of trials and opposition. And kings are going to show up and have their own prophets, prophets they pay to say the words they want to hear. Who are we supposed to believe? People who lie and manipulate God's words. Prophets were a gift of God to his people, but they were not enough. Even Elijah falls short and needs God's grace and intervention. This is what Malachi, Malachi, the prophet, writes. No, Micah, I was wrong. Micah 3.1. I don't think it's Malachi. You can check me on that. This is in the Bible. <laughs> Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you will seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord God. The Lord of hosts. So the prophets ultimately told of a better messenger, a better Word, the Word made flesh who would dwell among us. The Word of God that doesn't just confront us and convict us, but invites us, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. We need a better prophet, Jesus Christ. We're calling Elijah God's mountain man. I think it's a great title. It's catchy. I'll remember it. But the true mountain man in this story is Jesus Christ. Elijah is going to climb to the top of Mount Carmel to do battle with the gods of this world, and he's going to emerge victorious. But Christ is going to drag the wood of his own sacrifice up a mountain to declare war on sin and death with his own blood and emerge victorious. Elijah is going to be fed and sustained by God's power on the mountaintop with food and water so he can complete his mission. Jesus Christ is forsaken by God and denied a sip of water on his parched lips so that he can purchase our salvation. Elijah is going to stand on a mountain in despair of his own life, assuming God is absence from his trouble. But Jesus will be forsaken by his father, hang by his hands, cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And willingly give up his own life to ultimately defeat hopelessness and sin in the lives of all who would believe in him. Jesus is better. Jesus is perfect, the perfect king who leads his people with righteousness, equity, and power. He will never stray and never has to the left or to the right. Jesus is the perfect priest who by his own blood and own holiness stands in the presence of God, continually advocating for those who are his own. And Jesus is the perfect prophet. He speaks only what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, to convict and draw people To God. And his word doesn't just have power to confront, but to transform. That's the point of the book of Kings. So as we turn our attention to God's word and Elijah, I'm going to pray that we have our desires formed to eagerly await the second coming of our perfect Savior, Jesus, because he's coming back to the mountain one more time in perfect victory. Jesus, God's mountain man. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have told the story of history. 
with your hand of love and grace and power and righteousness over it all. And thank you for this story that we can look at what you have done and be hopeful and confident in the future. Your faithfulness, Lord, is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. But we see that it is so. I ask you to give us hearts to believe and trust that if there is any here who do not know the gift of Christ as our better king, priest, and prophet, that they would hear your word this morning and be transformed. Bless us as we sing a closing song in worship of this God. Thank you for opening the gates of the Holy of Holies, tearing that curtain so we could stand here and our words and our worship and our affection can come directly before your throne and please you, Lord. Hear us and fill our hearts with your spirit and joy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's been so good to worship together. If you would like some prayer for anything in your life, if you feel that just struggling with the sins that these stories of these kings resonated, we'd love to pray and commit you to the Lord. If you're interested in being baptized in the coming weeks, we'd love to talk with you. Um, there's also still room in our church history class tonight. Esther made extra binders in faith, knowing that some of you would love to join us. So 4.30, you would be free to join. We just started. We're only one week in, so there's, there's room for you. But let me close with these words from 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace.